Thank you again for joining us. My name is Alicia Cuyate. I am the Engagement and Recruitment Coordinator here at the Association of Schools and Programs of Public Health. Um, and I'm really excited to share the presenters we have with you today. I think we're gonna have some excellent conversations and you'll have some even better ones in the breakout rooms. So let's get us started. Um, throughout the session, we will be accepting questions, especially for our individual um, schools and programs. We will also be having a Q&A session at the end. So if you have any questions, please do feel free to put them down in the chat box at the bottom of the screen. You'll see some instructions up right now, and I'll give you a second to read those. You're also more than welcome to change the layout of this presentation so that you can only see our presenters or those with their cameras on. Um, this will just be a little helpful in seeing what great uh, admissions officer is speaking to you uh, and make it easier to make some contact later on. So these are the list of presenters that I mentioned. I think it's going to be really wonderful. Once again, um, I'll let you kind of take in the amazing information we're going to get for a second before we actually get started. So without further ado, I will let East Tennessee State go ahead and take it away. Thank you. Uh, let me go ahead and uh, pull my screen up here for you guys. All right, are you able to see it? Looks great. All right, thank you. Um, so I, uh, my name is Jared. I'm with East Tennessee State University, the College of Public Health. And today I'm gonna run really quick through our graduate programs, um, some of the benefits that we offer and then some contact information as well. All right, so we offer three graduate degrees and then graduate certificates. Our graduate degrees are gonna be a master's in public health, a master's in health administration, and our doctorate in public health. Um, all of the asterisks you see there means it's offered on ground or online. Um, and the ones that don't have the asterisks obviously are just on ground. Um, we do have four concentrations in our MPH. We have biostatistics, um, community health, and um, environmental health and epidemiology. And then our DRPH is epidemiology, community health, and then um, health management and policy. And as you can see down there, we have an executive track and a standard track. An executive track is basically just a um, shortened track for people that have experience, um, career experience in health administration. Um, and then the four core competencies are down there as well. Okay, so um, all of the MPH, MHA, and DRPH have they have the same requirements that you have to submit. And, um, there is no GRE required for any of them. Um, matter of fact, the DRPH, they're not even reviewing uh, GREs anymore. Um, the MHA and the MPH, uh, if you're on that GPA line, uh, we always recommend sending a GRE, GRE score if you do have one, um, but it's not required. Uh, three rec letters, a personal statement and official, and official transcripts um, with uh, the domestic application being a 2.75 and a 4.0 and then um, a 3.0 on a 4.0 for international applications. Um, you can see all of those uh, deadlines are there. They're also located in SOFIS where you'll submit your application. Um, but all of them I wrote them out here for you guys if you wanted to write them down. All right, we do offer graduate certificates. Um, I do wanna note while you're getting your MPH, um, you can pick up a graduate certificate as well. You can't pick it up in the same concentration that you got. So if you get a concentration in epidemiology, you can't pick up a graduate certificate in epidemiology, but you can pick it up in global health, for example. A um, little bit different on the um, admissions requirements. We still need transcripts, three recs, and a personal statement, but it's a 2.5 on a 4.0 for domestic applications and a 3.0 on a 4.0 still for international applications. Um, we do offer online and on ground. So uh, all the asterisks you see there are either online or on ground. And then our role help is on ground only. Um, some of the benefits here, um, we do have applied practice, 300 uh, plus field experience hours, and then 150 waiver if you have four years of experience, four plus years of experience in the field. Uh, five research centers within the college. Um, we do offer tuition scholarships and GA positions um, as well. And then we are a, uh, we do have partnership with the Coverdale program. So if you're returning Peace Corps, we offer that as well. Um, lastly here, here's our contact information. Um, if you do have your phone with you, you can go ahead and scan our um, QR code there that takes you to our link tree, which is pretty much everything I just said um, in all in different tabs within the link tree that you can uh, see there. Um, but that pretty much sums up everything for East Tennessee State University. I um, hope you guys have questions and bring them to the uh, breakout sessions. But up next, I believe, is George Mason. I'm going to go ahead and 
stop sharing screens here. All right. Thank you. So next up, we're going to have George Mason University. Sorry, I had trouble a minute getting my share up. Um, hi, I'm Franny Dove. I'm the graduate admissions specialist for the College of Health and Human Services at George Mason University. So George Mason is located in Fairfax, Virginia, which is about 30 minutes outside of DC. It's Virginia's largest public research university. It's an R1 institution. Diversity is one of our core values. We were just recently named the most diverse university in Virginia, and we're located very close and easy to get into the Washington um, DC area, but we're in the DC metropolitan region. So this is an overview of, I'm gonna be going over just our global and community health programs, but we also have programs in health administration and policy, nutrition, nursing, and social work. So our graduate programs in global and community health, we have a PhD in public health with two specialties, um, epidemiology and social and behavioral health. We also have a master's in public health um, that has concentrations in community health promotion, epidemiology, food security and nutrition, global health and health policy. We have a master of science in global health and a certificate in public health. And this is the beautiful Peterson Family Health Sciences Hall on our Fairfax campus where most of these classes would take place. So our PhD is 72 credits. Um, there are seven courses in the concentration and some core courses, a teaching practicum and a dissertation. Um, it's an opportunity to work really closely with one of our faculty uh, members on research that interests you. Um, our public health MPH is 42 credits, and this is where the difference is between our global health MS and maybe a global health concentration in an MPH is that the MS is thesis driven, and for our public health, we have a practicum, which is great with the opportunities in the DC region. Our generalist certificate can be completed online or in person. Um, sometimes we have students that start with the certificate and then apply to get into the MPH program and is, are able to transfer their credits. So it's an 18 credit program um, with five MPH core courses and one elective course. So here are some of our application deadlines. So we accept the certificate for spring and fall starts. Um, the rest of our programs are all fall starts. The PhD um, is in December 1st, and those decisions usually come out in February. Um, the MPH March 1st, the Global Health MS April 1st, and the certificate in March 1st again. And just here's a brief, brief overview of some of our faculty research expertise. I know I said brief, there's a lot on the slide. So if you see anything that interests you and you wanna go over it, I'm excited to chat with you. Um, when we do the breakout groups. So some of our expertise, um, nutrition, public health, nutrition, environmental health, um, global health, women's health, um, lots of faculty in those specialties. Our applications are through SOFAS, um, which is like a community application portal. I think a lot of us use SOFAS. Um, and we require a statement of goals and objectives, two letters of recommendation, three for the PhD, resume, and for international applicants, we have English proficiency and a WEST evaluation. We also have information sessions, which are a great opportunity to meet with our director of the program directly, and then uh, she usually brings in students that you can talk to um, and ask questions about their own experiences in the program. And those signups are on our publichealth.gmu.edu website. And I'll be available in the chat afterwards. Um, here is our contact information and I look forward to chatting with you all. Um, next, I would like to introduce my colleague from SUNY Downstate School of Public Health. Hello, everyone. There's like a delay with everything. <laughs> so I'm going to share my screen. 
Hey, hi, my name is Rayanne Rolston and I'm the Student Recruitment Specialist for SUNY Downstate School of Public Health. I'm really excited to be with you here to just chat a little bit more about my institution. So about SUNY Downstate, uh, we started in 2001 and really have emerged as a leader in public health education, community service, and research. We are located in the heart of Brooklyn, New York. We know Brooklyn is a borough of immigrants, so our curriculum has an emphasis on urban and immigrant health issues. And we really try to collaborate with a lot of the community-based organizations and hospitals in the surrounding area to address health disparities within these communities. Um, we have four academic departments, which you see here, that host all of our concentration and our academic programs, which I'll talk a little bit more on the next slide. So we offer a Master of Public Health in five concentrations. Um, you would select one, but you can rank up to three to apply to. It's a 42 credit program. You can do it on a part-time or full-time basis. And for all of our programs, we offer online, in-person, and hybrid options. Then we have a doctor of Public Health. It's a 45 credit program, mostly taken on a part-time basis as a lot of the doctorate students hold full-time positions. And we offer that in three um, concentrations. We have three advanced certificates. These can be done completely online. We have the general advanced certificate in public health, which you can take and then transition into the MPH program. All of your credits will transfer over as long as you maintain a 3.0 GPA. We also have an advanced certificate in climate change and planetary health and one in public health geriatrics. We also offer a concurrent degree with our College of Medicine. So it's an MD MPH degree that students can get if they are enrolled in the College of Medicine at SUNY Downstate. So what really sets us apart, some things I just wanted to highlight are affordable tuition. Um, we have $471 per credit for New York State residents, small class sizes, the average is 13 to one. It's geared towards working professionals. Um, so if you wanna get a full-time or part-time position, our classes, if they're in person, they're in evening hours between 5.30 to 8.30, but we also have those online options as well. Urban and immigrant health focus, great diversity, not only racial diversity, but also academic. Um, we have no restrictions for academic um, backgrounds. So our students are in social work, they're in business, and then they decide that they want to come in. Of course, we have public health, and we have a lot of students in the nursing and medical program that are enrolled in our school as well. Um, you get to benefit from Downstate's infrastructure. So Downstate is the only health sciences um, university like academic medical center within Brooklyn. Um, so our students can benefit from the research um, centers, the labs, um, all of the different partnerships that is offered with that institution. Uh, we have a lot of collaborations and partnerships with surrounding hospitals. So students um, are able to get opportunities there as well. An emphasis on engage learning, exceptional faculty and mentorship. Each student gets a faculty advisor, but a lot of our students collaborate with faculty in other departments as well as clinical departments within the hospital as well. Exemplary student outcomes. So our students are getting nationally recognized for their work in public health. Um, they're doing a lot of publishing. Um, they also attend a lot of the premier conferences within um, New York and APHA, et cetera. And we sponsor a lot of those opportunities for our students students. Um, so this is my contact information. So if you join me in the breakout room, I'll talk a lot more about our admission requirements and deadlines. We're on SOFIS as well. We also accept um, three times for the year. So we have spring, summer, and fall enrollment. So I'm looking forward to speaking with you all more. Thank you. Thank you. And next up, we have University of New England. Hi, everyone. I'm Nicole Lindsay. I'm the Director of Online Admissions for University of New England. Um, and I'm excited to um, share with you some information about our graduate programs in public health here today. Um, just a little bit about the University of New England. So we have a campus located here in Southern Maine. Um, but our graduate programs in public health are 100% online. So there are no campus visits required um, and we are CEF accredited. 
Um, we do offer a master's degree in public health, which is 46 credits, and also a graduate certificate in public health, which is 18 credits. Um, similar to some of the other schools that have um, shared already here today, you can start with the graduate certificate and then roll that into um, completing the master's degree um, after the fact. So um, we don't require a GRE for our admissions requirements. Um, for the master's program, you could choose between a generalist track or um, we have a new focus area in epidemiology. Um, we have some really great uh, faculty members who are practitioners, researchers, and educators that we're really proud of. Um, we offer a strong networking forum and career-oriented curriculum that really prepares our students well to uh, begin work um, or continue work in the field of public health. Um, so as I mentioned, we're really proud of our scholar practitioner model, and so we wanted to highlight a few of our faculty members here for you. Um, you can see Kenyatta, Ivan, and Kathleen are just a few of our faculty members that are really engaged in the field of public health. Um, Kenyatta focuses on in infectious disease epidemiology. Um, Ivan is really focused on employee health and safety. And Kathleen does a lot of really great work in public health, um, in global health, excuse me. And so um, these are just a few of the faculty members that teach our online courses for our programs. Um, so I mentioned that our campus is located um, in Southern Maine. We actually have two campuses, one in Portland, which you can see here behind me, um, and one in Biddeford, Maine. Um, but because we are a 100% online program, we actually have students that are um, enrolled in our programs but are living anywhere across the world. So we wanted to highlight a few of that global diversity for you here um, so you can see an example of that. So um, as you can see, um, Fred graduated our program in, um, in 2012, and he was living right here in Maine. Um, but we also have Gloria, who graduated our program in 2018, um, who was living in Kenya. So lots of really great um, variety of background and experience, but also um, lots of really great insight from our students who are living really um, all over the world. Um, we also offer a really strong support system for our students that are enrolled in our programs. And so you can see here members of our student um, support team. So Haley, Zach, Jessica, and Catherine are um, student support specialists that work directly with students once enrolled in the program. Um, because we are 100% online, we really want to make that um, connection to um, just kind of logistics within the university as simple as possible for our students. And so our student support specialists work to um, support students with, you know, things related to registration and courses, textbooks, connecting with faculty, um, navigating the online platform, or really anything else you might need um, as you're enrolled in the program, kind of helping you get to graduation. We also offer um, a cross-cultural immersion experience um, that allows our students the opportunity to um, work on some pretty specific um, projects and travel to Ghana. Um, and we, Jennifer here, which you can see in the photo here in the top right corner, will be in our breakout session. We can definitely talk to you a little bit more about what that experience looks like. Um, we also, through those um, applied practicum experience um, opportunities, Again, because we are online, we have students that are doing some um, really great work across the world. So some examples of this are um, organizations like Girls on the Run in California, but also um, Living in Peace in Kenya. Um, you can see a few other examples here on the map. Um, our application is not currently offered through SOFIS. We have our own application offered through our website. You can see the website right there. It's currently free to apply. We have six start dates a year. Um, our next start date, um, the deadline is November 29th for courses that begin January 5th. Um, and you can see a photo here of Holland. He's one of our enrollment counselors assigned to this program. Um, he will also be in our breakout session and um, can talk with you more about the specifics of our admission requirements, um, but know that we do have enrollment counselors that are here to support you um, throughout your application um, and beginning the program. All right, so I will stop sharing my screen and hand it over to the University of Oklahoma. Sorry, I think I shared the wrong screen. So I'll just try that again. <laughs> great. Are you all seeing my PowerPoint? That's great. 
Okay, thank you, sorry about that. So hi everyone, I am Shannon Cavish. I'm the student recruiter for the Hudson College of Public Health at the University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center. A little bit about our college. So we are located in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. The Health Sciences Center has seven colleges that are all focused in health sciences and health professions, um, which really allow our students to have a lot of interdisciplinary education and collaboration experiences across the campus. We do have pretty small class sizes. We currently have about 175 enrolled students and 40 full-time faculty. We are the only SEEP accredited school of public health in the state of Oklahoma. And for the previous academic year, 2020 to 2021, we were able to award 34 scholarships with, from our college and provide more than $750,000 in graduate student stipends. We offer four different degrees. Um, so we have a Master of Public Health in six different degree tracks. Students are able to apply to multiple uh, degree tracks. And then if they were admitted to multiple, they would choose which one they wanted to enroll in. We do also offer a Master of Health Administration degree, a Master of Science in four different disciplines. And in particular, our Master of Science in Industrial Hygiene is one of only about a little over 20 AVA accredited industrial hygiene programs in the country. And lastly, we also have a PhD program in four different disciplines and a certificate in population health. Um, like many others, we do use SOFIS for our application process and for all of the programs, applicants are required to provide transcripts, current resume or CV, a personal statement, and three letters of recommendation. And then we do also have a supplemental application that applicants are required to submit. For our international applicants, they are also required to um, provide an English proficiency score, either TOEFL or IELTS, or submit a waiver and all of their international coursework will be evaluated by WES. Um, last thing I want to mention is that our the GRE is only required for our MS and PhD programs. So if you're applying for the MPH or MHA, you do not have to take the GRE. Um, so we have a rolling admissions process. What that means is that as soon as we receive all of an applicant's um, admissions materials, it will go to the committee for review. Um, but we do have deadlines that I'm happy to talk about more in the breakout rooms. That's the last day to have all of your materials submitted. For our MPH program, we allow students to start in the fall, spring, or summer semesters. The MHA program starts in the fall, and then our MS and PhD programs start in either the fall or the spring. And I'll wrap that up with my contact information, and I'd love to talk to you all more in the breakout rooms in more detail. So now I will turn it over to the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so yeah, welcome all for coming. I'm Karen Van Alken, and I'm the graduate advisor at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee in the Zilba School of Public Health. Um, so a little bit about our school. Our school was founded in 2009 and accredited in 2017. And we're part of UWM, who is a uh, R1 university. And we also take pride in being Wisconsin's only accredited and dedicated school of public health. As you can tell, this is our school and behind us is the Pfizer form, which is the home of the Milwaukee Bucks. So go Bucks. If you're not familiar with the Bucks, um, they're the NBA uh, champions of this year. So that was very exciting um, in the summer. So uh, again, on our picture, you can see the, our school and we're located really downtown Milwaukee. We're not located on main campus. For the reason that um, we want to give back to the community, we want to give back to, um, to the public. So we are located right there in a zip code that can benefit the most from the public health work that we're doing. And um, it also helps us um, get our mission. So our mission is advancing pop uh, population health, health equity, and social and environmental justice. 
So um, we have lots of community partners in um, Milwaukee and Wisconsin and even beyond that. And our students, they will have a field experience and a capstone experience built into our MPH programs. And they'll do their field experience and capstones with one of those community partners. If students need to go to main campus for some reason, there's always a shuttle bus that drives back and forth or by car, it's um, 10 minutes. So I'll go talk about a little bit about our programs. So we have a bachelor's of science in public health and an accelerated program. But then for the graduates, um, we have five MPH um, tracks. So the community behavioral health promotion, environmental health sciences, biostatistics, epidemiology, public health policy and administration. For those um, applications, the GRE is not required and everything is through SOFAs. And all the programs that you're seeing are on campus. We do not have any online programs, unfortunately. We also do have a um, Master's of Science in the Biostatistics, and the GRE is required for that. Uh, as well for the PhD, um, the GRE is required for the Community Behavioral Health Promotion, Environmental Health Sciences, Biostatistics, and Epidemiology. Unfortunately, Biostatistics for the PhD is not accepting any students for fall 2022. Um, other requirements for all of these um, graduate programs are transcripts, resume, uh, three letters of recommendation, and then a personal statement as well. And then for the PhD, um, a writing sample is also required. Our deadlines, so we have a, a spring deadline and a fall deadline. So we have um, two, uh, two times that you can start a program, so spring and fall. Unfortunately, the spring deadline has passed for uh, spring 22. But for the PhD um, deadline, the deadline is December 1st. And then we work with a priority deadline for the MPH and the MS. Um, so the priority deadline means scholarship deadline. So if you apply before that deadline, um, you will automatically be considered for scholarships. So you don't have to fill out an other application for scholarships. You're just automatically considered. Um, then afterwards, we do have like a rolling admissions for internationals for the MPH and the MS. Um, and that will be uh, May 20th. And then for the domestic, um, students, um, it's going to be June 30th. But again, the scholarships are very limited at that point. Again, everything is through SOFAs and as most of our programs. And that's it. My contact information is right there. It's applyph at uwm.edu. And I'll also be in the breakout sessions if you have any other questions. I'll hand it over now to the Washington University in St. Louis. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Makia Algamdi. I'm the Admissions and Recruitment Specialist for the Brown School at Washington University in St. Louis. Um, here you have at the top our value statement. We are dedicated to equity and committed to impact. This is the type of work that we really care about at the Brown School, so we hope that you can join us in this type of work. So let's look at our numbers real quickly. Uh, the Brown School has three graduate programs, the Master of Public Health, uh, as well as a Master of Social Work and Master of Social Policy. We also have a nine to one student to faculty ratio, meaning students are able to really connect with their faculty inside and outside the classroom and form those great mentorship uh, connections and relationships. Uh, we also have 19 faculty affiliated uh, research centers with three community-based research. So there's lots of research opportunities for our students if they are interested in research. We also have 15 plus student groups and leadership opportunities. So if you have any type of hobbies, interests, uh, identities that you wanna come meet other students at the Brown School, you definitely have the option um, and it's always growing. And then we also have 400 plus field education practicum sites. Um, what's great about the practicum sites here at the Brown School, students actually have the option to choose uh, the practicum site that they apply to uh, rather than being signed. And this number is always growing because we have new sites added each year. 
Um, and then last but not least, we have 100% uh, of our students requesting scholarship will receive an award, which is great. And so real quickly, I wanna talk about why the Brown School has brought public health, social work, and social policy under one roof. And it's really because they're all in a way connected and it's important to know how they all interact with each other, especially once you are in the field. Um, and so this is a, a, it's just very unique to the Brown School. Most uh, public health schools don't have all three together. Um, just wanted to share that fact. And so let's talk more about our curriculum. Uh, it, it, it really was designed to be different. We have a transdisciplinary approach uh, so, for instance, in your public health courses, you may also talk about social policy and social work. Uh, we also have a health equity focus. Uh, we're very much evidence-based, um, and we have lots of applied research. A lot of the research papers that you'll be reading, uh, the authors most likely will be your uh, faculty professors, uh, which is pretty, uh, pretty neat opportunity to meet. Uh, the people who write your research papers. Um, and then we also have skill labs. These are uh, one credit hour labs uh, for students to really get hands-on experience um, that are, or hands-on applicable skills that are, would be really beneficial for you in uh, the field, such as grant writing, um, statistical analysis, uh, project management. And so let's have a look at the program details. So we have uh, six STEM certified specialization areas in the MPH program. We have the generalist, epidemiology, by statistics, global health, health policy analysis, mental and behavioral health, and urban design. And so uh, the MPH program is a two year program. It's uh, 52 credit hours. And so this is what your timeline will kind of look like. So your first year, you're really gonna focus on your foundation coursework. Um, and then you'll have your practicum in the summer. And then your second year, you're gonna jump into your specialized coursework. Um, and then for students who are currently an undergraduate uh, uh, public health student, you can possibly come in with advanced status, uh, which will uh, kind of cut down your timeline at Brown School. And then if you are also interested in social policy or social work, you do have the option to pursue a dual degree. Uh, that'll make your time at the Brown School from two years to three years. Um, and if you are interested in other areas, um, you also have the, uh, uh, the option to do a joint degree from our other schools at WashU. So you can possibly do a public health degree with a law degree or even an MD degree uh, or architecture. So you have lots of options to choose from. And then for students who are interested in the PhD program, we do have a PhD program at the Brown School. Um, here is the contact information for them. Uh, we have two separate offices for the master's program and PhD program. And then last but not least, um, you can apply to our program through SOPAS. Um, here are a few deadlines that you can, you can uh, keep in mind. The first one coming up is our early action, uh, December 15. It's for students who are really uh, needing to get an answer by end of January, early uh, February. And then we also have an info session coming up next month about international student experience. And if you have any questions, of course, come by the breakout room and I can give you more details. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you to all of our presenters for that really informative uh, session. I definitely got a lot out of that. I'm gonna share my screen really quickly um, and open it up for our Q&A session. Um, so on the screen are just some basic instructions on how to leave a comment in the chat and ask a question to our um, institutions and our presenters today. Um, while you all are thinking about any questions you have, I'll go ahead and kick it off with a pretty popular question, um, which is just about the GRE. So is it necessary? Do you need to take it? Not for George Mason. Um, I don't know if, if it might even be better if, if anyone has it to say that they, that they require it, because I know a lot of us have waived it. So at OU, um, it is only required for our Master of Science and our PhD programs, but not for the Master of Public Health or Master of Health Administration. Uh, yeah, sorry. I was just gonna say for the Brown School, it is not a requirement at the moment. For um, University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, um, it's also required for the PhD and for the Master's of Science, not for the MPH. University of New England does not require the GRE at all. 
personally downstate, um, it's only required for the Doctorate of Public Health if you did not come from a CIF accredited program in undergrad. So a lot of exceptions, so small population. Thank you. Those answers are giving me um, what I think is going to be a, a trend throughout these answers, which is it's important to read the admissions requirements and instructions on the website or given to you because it seems like it really depends on what's going on. Um, Jared, did you have something you wanted to add or? Uh, no, I was just going to second that, that ETSU doesn't require that we don't um, even review GREs for the DRPH. All right. Um, so, oh, another really common question. So I'll give you this one next, which is what are common mistakes applicants make while writing their personal statement? I think it'd be helpful if we can give maybe a little bit of what the personal statement's really there for. So I'll start off. Um, I think the way that we say it is that we do do a holistic review at our institution at SUNY Downstate. Um, so we definitely um, want students to use that opportunity to use your personal voice um, to tell us things outside of what we can see in the transcript and letters of recommendation. Um, I would say some common mistakes is not personalizing to the institution. I think that's the number one thing. And if you're part of an admissions committee, it hurts our hearts. Um, we want to see that you have done research about the institution. You really want to be a value member of our community, and we want you at the institution. So we want to see, you know, why it is that you want to um, be a member of our school. I'll echo that and also say um, not answering the prompts. Um, when when we give you questions that we'd like specifically answered, um, we'd love to see your answers so that we can figure out where your interests lie, where you stand out. It's about telling your story. So if if you're answering even another school's prompts through your goals and personal statements, I know that George Mason, sometimes people will say Georgetown, George Washington, George, you know, just double check that you have the right name too, even if it's not one that you've sent out other places, just double check um, before you send. And maybe even read it a day before, then read it and then leave it and then come back to it because it will read better or you'll notice your mistakes better the next day. I think for us, it's very similar in just making sure that, um, uh, you know, you are addressing the, the prompts while still taking the opportunity to be concise um, but bringing your application to life a bit, proofreading is huge, um, you know, but because we do review our applications holistically, it really does give applicants the chance to kind of emphasize any strengths that they have. Um, and like I said, kind of help bring their application to life um, a, bit, a bit better. Okay, similar to just the other proofreading comments for us would be if a student is applying to multiple tracks, so like, MPH in epidemiology and health promotion sciences, not tailoring their statement for each one. Um, if you have a general statement that applies to both, that's one thing, but if you're applying for epidemiology, but your all your goals are related to health promotion, that's not really gonna convince the epidemiology committee why you would be interested in their program. It was helpful, thank you. Um, so I'll go ahead and get started on a question that we get often. Um, but before that, I do wanna just remind any of our attendees that you're more than welcome to post any sort of questions related to applications in the chat and we'll get to them. If you're thinking them, someone else is probably also thinking them. Um, but while you guys are still getting thinking, um, I just wanna see if you guys could talk about different financial opportunities and how to kind of get those. I know it's gonna vary a lot depending on institution, but any baseline would be great. It's a, it's a hefty question. <laughs> yeah, our, students like are, <laughs> so our students are eligible for financial aid. So the first step would be filling out the FAFSA and getting that started, you know, just a, as soon as possible. Um, also connecting with our student financial services office. There are, um, you know, advisors there that are here to help support our students in kind of figuring that whole process out. Um, additionally, we do have some resources for external scholarships, and we just encourage our um, applicants and students to really explore all of those options and just for, you know, 
to, to apply to as many of, of those additional opportunities for scholarships that might be available and applicable to them. Agreed. I think also we've got, since we're more in-person program for the MPH um, and PhD, we'll have, I know PhD is mostly funded with um, some kind of graduate assistantship. There are graduate research assistantships available in our MPH and our MS. Um, there are positions across campus too, and some of them have tuition waivers. Um, and our provost office will post a lot of financial um, opportunities as well for scholarship. So that's something that it might be at other institutions too, is make sure you check that provost office page. It's not just the page of your, um, your college, but trying to see what other opportunities there are in the offices across the university. Um, and I'll second that. I just also want to mention that we, the ETSU offers international merit scholarship as well um, as also TS and GA positions. I just went ahead and posted our link in there as well. And yeah, as, as I mentioned in my presentation, um, all students who indicate in their application portal that they're interested in scholarship will receive some scholarship award from the Brown School. In addition to that, we also have financial aid and as well as external uh, resources, external scholarship resources for our students, uh, as well as uh, part-time jobs for students. So if you have more questions, come to the breakout room and I can uh, give you more details. I was just going to add, so since we're a state institution, incoming scholarships, not really a thing, but um, we do have a lot of scholarships for enrolled students. So also just looking at, you know, sometimes the internal pages, like for current students, you see that there are opportunities for funding once you um, complete like the first core classes. Okay, for us, it's similar um, to SUNY. Um, all of our scholarships are for currently enrolled students, but we do award them annually. Um, and then we do also have graduate research assistantship positions available um, for all students. They're able, eligible to apply for any that they are qualified for. So I'm actually going to put an ASPPH resource called Financing Your Degree in the chat now, too, which is a, another good place to get started on searching for some of those financial opportunities. Um, related to that, we also did get a question um, if the FAFSA applies to international students as well, or I guess what ratio of those uh, financial opportunities do apply to international students. So no, FAFSA is federally funded, and so international students are not eligible for those. Um, and then you will want to check with your visa requirements and the program that you enrolled in what you're allowed to you know work and stuff like that so it will you know vary from institution to institution but international students have to prove that they can afford the education to get your um, visa so when you're making these decisions it's good to do all of that research to see you know what you'll be eligible for and i know that all of our institutions seem to have great advisors that you can reach out to who will talk you through that process because it will vary from school to school So um, I have another question about applications and international students, which is um, who is exempted from the English proficiency exam? Um, and is there any exceptions for that? And how might someone possibly get a waiver for that? So for OU, um, the students that are um, automatically eligible to get a waiver is primarily um, those who have already, <clears throat> excuse me, graduated from a U.S. accredited institution, either with a bachelor's or a master's degree. Um, and then I believe we have a few other exceptions of a, um, an applicant that was born outside the U.S. but then adopted by U.S. citizen parents. Um, but we do have a waiver process as part of our supplemental application. Um, applicants can um, fill that out, provide any documentation they have to support their claim that they should be waived, and then it will be reviewed by our office. Um, but it's case by case basis. It's similar for us, but we also have um, a list on our website if the applicant ha um, is from a country or an institution where English is a primary language. So that's kind of another way um, to, to get around that for us. Yeah, and that's a great point, Nicole. And if you're looking for those specific countries, check the specific um, 
website of the institution that you're applying to because they will list the countries in which they will waive if somebody is coming in from that country or um, has studied in that country. Yeah, I think once we're nodding a lot, that means it's pretty much the same with our institutions. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. All right, well, we'll go to this next question, which is also about international students. Um, and it's about GPA. So uh, I guess, what are the options if the student has less than, for instance, maybe a 3.0 or what's listed as a required GPA? Are there ways to get around that or any workarounds? Or I guess, how do you interact with that? So I don't know if this is the same for the institutions who have certificates to MPH transition. Um, we would recommend if you're falling below that threshold um, that you can apply to our advanced certificate. So if we review, we'll contact you and let you know that this might be a better fit or, um, you know, then you can do that yourself if you know, like your GPA, because um, it's a bit lower. So for our school, it's like a 2.5, we look for advanced certificate. Um, so we'd recommend students to do that. And once you maintain a 3.0 in the five courses that are required, which you still be in class with the MPH students, um, then you can transition and it's just like a form and you're basically selecting your concentration. So that's really what the difference is. For us, we review applications holistically, so it wouldn't just be, you know, the GPA that would necessarily, um, you know, impact whether or not an applicant were um, accepted or not. Um, but we do have an additional personal statement that we do ask applicants to address if they do have a lower GPA, um, just to explain, you know, maybe what those circumstances were, or if it were a long time ago, you know, what has changed and why they think they're able to be more successful now. Um, we don't have separate admissions kind of uh, requirements or thresholds for our graduate certificate or the master's program, but we would definitely encourage um, anyone to apply, whether they have a lower GPA or not. Um, and then, you know, if um, the admissions committee decided that the application or the GPA or academic background wasn't quite strong enough, we might recommend taking a graduate level course as a non matriculated student um, just to kind of test it out and then um, kind of again be able to prove um, the ability to be successful in that graduate level course and then kind of add that to an application in the future. And if you do have below a 3.0 and you have done great in classes that pertain to the MPH, but maybe you haven't done great in some courses that you were supposed to take that you won't be taking <laughs> further beyond, put that in your goals or personal statement and really tell your story about that because our team will read that and take that as Nicole was saying that holistic approach that a lot of universities take to you want to explain in your own words what happened um, so that we can know. I, will, I do want to add that um, though a lot of people are not requiring the GRE, if you have taken the GRE, it is an expensive test and you did well on it and you're on that line with your GPA, it's not unheard of to submit that to the Hunter resume. That's great. Um, I did just see um, a question about submitting applications at different times and if that's possible in SOFAS. And the short answer is yes, it is. Um, I'm going to post a link in the chat right now that just talks about submitting your SOFAS applications and the process and some of the timing of that, which might be a really helpful resource for you. Um, we have a question which I think is really great about talking about the flexibility of an MPH, which is asking if you have a Bachelor um, of Science and Forestry degree, or I'll even add in if you don't have work experience, is it possible to still apply and get into an MPH program? <laughs> A lot of firm nods. A hundred percent, yes. Like we have tons of students from all kinds of different backgrounds. And I think that's really what makes, it's like a strength, you know, of, of this field and of this program and that students are able to bring in their experiences and their background knowledge. Um, and it just lends really well to like the future in the field. So yeah, hundred percent, yes. Yeah, I'm sure we'll get other answers that very much echo that one. I don't know if anyone has anything else to add. Okay, we're feeling good about that. Um, so we have another question um, from an international student, um, which is asking if the course by course evaluated GPA um, 
or if it is a course by course evaluated GPA or a, like a straight GPA from the other institution that's looked at. Um, I'm assuming that this is related to SOFIS applications. Um, so I don't know if any of you want to kind of dig into that a little bit about how the GPA is calculated. You know, it's a complicated answer. Yeah, wait, can you say it again? So on the West, there's a cumulative GPA that's stated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just basically how is the GPA calculated and what elements are looked um, are looked at to calculate it? Oh, for the West. Yeah, just in general. Yeah, for the West, I mean, they do it. They put it to, so they take whatever is your educational system and they basically go course by course and say the student got like an A or a B equivalent, C equivalent, and then they give us a cumulative GPA out of a 4.0. So for our admissions committee, they usually, um, they do look at the content areas like Nicole talked about, like specific to the public health and to the concentration that you're applying to. Um, and then they also look at just that cumulative GPA just to see. Um, but yeah, I think that answers it. I don't know if anybody else. Yeah, I think that's a good answer. Um, we also got another great answer in the chat. It will be calculated and they'll do it on their end and they'll do it in a way to try and uh, be able to more evenly look at different institutions against each other and applicants just to make it easier on the admissions end. Um, I'm gonna put in chat another link uh, that just talks about uh, submitting uh, non-US applications and specifically West evaluations as well. All right, oh, I sent that as a direct message. So um, and sure, so someone's talking that um, they got an institutional GPA of a 3.0, um, but according to their West evaluation, they got a GPA of 3.13. And the question is, which one will be looked at? And it, the answer is the West evaluation. Am I correct in that? All right, yeah, that's great. Um, I'm not seeing any more questions in the chat. I don't know if any of you have any firm advice about applications, about timing, about getting everything in that might be helpful to our students before we start our breakout rooms. I think we touched on a lot of good stuff. We talked about GPAs, transcripts, um, personal statements, which is a really big one, reading the website, um, application requirements, and all that good stuff. So if you don't have any questions, I'll go ahead and open it up the breakout rooms. But before I do that, I just wanna share with you all some upcoming events that we are having. So um, you all can find any other upcoming events on the link on the screen. We have two events coming up just next week, which are gonna be great. Um, we're gonna equally have some wonderful presenters, some wonderful institutions representing. Um, and yeah, I think it'll be really informative. So definitely feel free to register for those as well on the mrspublichealth.org slash events page, which I'm sure you registered for this one on as well. Um, so yeah, we'll go ahead, open the breakout rooms. I want to take time to thank our presenters once again for sharing their knowledge and information and hopefully sharing it with you all as well. Um, breakout rooms are open. We'll give our presenters a second to get in, get settled, and feel free to choose your rooms and uh, mingle. Thank you for joining, everyone. <laughs>